Amen. As we've looked at this idea of progressive sanctification, we've talked about how the main reason for our own salvation is so that God would make us holy. He'd make a holy people for his own possession. God saved us to make us holy. Progressive sanctification, we know, is an ongoing growth of personal holiness in a believer's life. One resource defines progressive sanctification this way. In sanctification, God, working especially by the Holy Spirit, separates believers unto himself and makes them increasingly holy, progressively transforming them into the image of Christ by subduing the power of sin in their lives and enabling them to bear the fruit of obedience in their lives. Last week, we looked at some of the theological grounding of what sanctification is. We looked at what it is. We looked at what does it look like. And we looked at even some of the hindrances to sanctification. Our topic this morning, as we look at our perspective in sanctification and our power in sanctification... It gets to two of the hindrances that we have in our growth and holiness. One of those hindrances is what? We take our eyes, our attention, our focus off of what is most important in life. We take our eyes off of the glory of God and we put it on something else to the point where it becomes our God in the moment. And we also know that in this fallen world, Life is really, really hard at times. And even when things might be going okay, we can become exhausted just from the normal rhythms of life. Family, work, busyness. They all have a way of wearing us down and beating us up. And we can easily become weary and we can even become depressed in those moments. So whether we have become discouraged or feeling really low or just simply exhausted, in those low moments, our sanctification, it can become stunted. And we find ourselves simply going through the motions of life, almost on autopilot. Everyday tasks become simply boxes to check. And even our spiritual disciplines, they sometimes lose the sweet flavor and excitement we know that they should have. Bible reading. Prayer, even church attendance. While we know that we need these things, there are times that our heart feels dull to them. And we wonder where our excitement about Christ has gone. And we wonder how have we forgotten about eternal life and the gift we've been given by God's grace. It's not that we've forgotten it, but we've taken our focus off of it. We remember times when God's word so captured our heart. And prayer was vibrant, and fellowship with others was rich and deep. And in those little moments, we ask ourselves, how did I get here? What happened? And in those moments of exhaustion, discouragement, and feeling overwhelmed with life, we're tempted then to believe, to believe lies, trusting our own feelings, or that something that this world offers us will really, really, really make us feel better. I mean, really make us feel better to the point that I'll be satisfied. And the satisfaction that we're longing for becomes a puff of air that's gone. We can't hold on to it because it's temporary. It's, it's finite. It's, it's of this world. So see, we can become tempted to forget where our perspective should be. That's one of the problems. And the other problem then is what? In our exhaustion, in our times of feeling low, we forget that our power in sanctification, our power to even do the things that God asks us to do, does not reside with us. It resides in us. Because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who is powerful. And we have the grace of God, which is powerful. It's a grace that works in us. So we lose perspective and we forget about power. And when we lose perspective and forget about power, 
life around us becomes dull or even more difficult than it should be. Because we know already in this fallen world that life is already going to be hard. Things are going to fall apart around us. We are not sovereign. We can't control things. And when you combine the reality of a fallen world with our forgetting who we are and where our power comes from, you combine those together, that's why we feel low. That's why the glories of heaven become so distant all of a sudden. So our main idea this morning is this. Our growth in holiness, it is strengthened by first having the right perspective and secondly, by depending on the right source of power. So our first point this morning, our perspective in sanctification, it is God's glory. God's glory. We see it right here in the verse I read to you this morning. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. The idea with beholding there, that word, it means to reflect as in a mirror. That's literally what the word means, to reflect as in a mirror. And we all, reflecting within a mirror the glory of the Lord, something happens. What does the verse say? When we behold the glory of the Lord, when we look at the reflection of the glory of the Lord in our own lives, what happens? We are being transformed into the same image as what we see. You see, whatever it is that we put a lot of focus on, whatever it is that we really contemplate, really study, really pay attention to, it will have a reflective effect in our own lives. It will. The idea is this. We become what we behold. We become what we behold. Now, I'm not talking about just the general things in life where we go have fun doing something. That doesn't want, that's not what behold means. I'm not talking about that we take an afternoon and just go play with the kids in the park. Oh, now I'm beholding. Play. No, that's not what it means. Beholding means something much greater. It means I am paying so close attention to something that it's going to have a reflective effect in my life. I'm that focused on it so much and so deeply. There's a depth to that beholding, and there's, an, a, I would say, a, a span of time to that beholding. Think about it. We see this in real life, don't we? If you're a parent or you're around small kids, you know what has happened. Every parent has had that moment where their child says or does something, and the parent goes, that sounded just like me. <laughs> and maybe you were really excited about that, or maybe you were horrified <laughs> about that. Why? Because children do that. Children are wired by God to look at mom and dad. Because remember, mom and dad, even though children don't fully know who God is yet, mom and dad represent something great to them. And they behold mom and dad. And they will do, and they will say what mom and dad do and say. That's not the focus of our sermon this morning, but parents take note. But right, that's what happens. Why? Because children inherently are going to do that. We also see it in other areas of life. We see this in the athletic arena of life. And it could be music, it could be lots of things. But let's just take the athletic one. There's lot, lots of examples, we'll just use this one. Athletes will do this. Athletes will find a professional or someone higher than them farther along the way in athleticism, and they will do what? They will study and meditate on their technique in every detail. Because I, I want my swing to be just like that. I want my shot to be just like that. I, I want my form to be just like that. And what will they do? With technology today, they can even take an athlete, video them, and break it down frame by frame by frame by frame. And what will other athletes do? They will study Meditate, why? Because they want to reflect it. Olympic athletes spend all of their lives doing this, reflecting those who are better than them so they can improve. So we know, we see this in life. 
But what is it as a believer that we should truly behold? We know it's not a what, it's a who. It is the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord. And chapter 4 tells us about that glory. Chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians tells us what? That it says in verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of the world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. They can't see him, right? But what does it say then? It says, in their, uh, the, the God of the world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, he says. Why? Because, verse 6, for God who said that light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There he is. God has taken the blinders off. The veil has been lifted. We can see him. We can behold him. He is the greatest object on which we could set our affections in all of the universe. There is nothing greater than him. Nothing. And it is in this very beholding, gazing upon, contemplating on the glories of Jesus Christ that we grow to be like him. Like a child looking at a parent. I want to be just like him. So I need to watch him. I need to look to him. I need to read about him. I need to study him. You see, we look upon Christ with the eyes of our hearts. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You rejoice with joy that's inexpressible and filled with glory. It's the joy that we only can have by looking at Jesus Christ. It's the joy that we only can have by understanding what he has done for us and beholding him in the greatness of salvation. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that when we do that, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This is a progressive transformation that occurs from one degree to another this is why we must understand we will never arrive at perfection in this life we never will but we will grow this is a powerful grace that works in us and it makes us grow and we participate in it we participate in it you see, beholding who Christ is, it imparts, it reflects to us then the truth of his glory and it's to us. And who are we? We're weak. We're fallible human beings. We're subject to sin. We're subject to suffering. And we're subject to death. And we're weak in that. And what do we need? We need strength. We need the right perspective. As we contemplate on the magnitude, the majesty, the glory of Christ, our affections will now be captured by the beauty of his glory. And we will find our ultimate satisfaction, our ultimate joy, and our long-lasting contentment in him. And then we won't run quickly to lesser, finite, and sinful pleasures of the world. We're like, why would I mess around with that? I've got Christ. Well, why am I going to play around with sin? I've got Jesus. I've been saved from that. Oh, I have the Lord. Why would I want to have anything in the world take my affections? My affections are set on him. And I love him because his love for me was first. And he saved me. You see, as then our affections are, are captured in this way, and it's captured by his glory, then it inwardly changes us. And we're shaped more and more and more into what is pleasing to Christ. 
And this inward change then will have an outward effect of obedience in our lives. But it's not just obedience, brothers and sisters. It's a joyful obedience. It's an obedience that brings us joy and pleasure and satisfaction. It's not an obedience that goes, well, look what I did. I'm really good. I did the right thing. No, it's obedience that says, that was pleasing to you, Lord, and that brings me joy. The author of Hebrews captures the same idea in Hebrews chapter 12, where he writes, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who are those witnesses? Chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is the great, some call it the great hall of faith, right? These examples of, guess what? Sinful people, but godly people who are looking, looking to what? Looking forward, looking forward to the, that they didn't, they didn't see Christ yet, but they knew God by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, they walked toward him. And then it says, as we are surrounded by them, let us also, let us also do what? Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Here it is, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, one and two. Let us what? Let us lay aside every sin that clings to us and run with endurance. And how do we do it? By looking to him. By looking to him, by beholding him, setting our eyes on him as we put sin to death and we pursue him with endurance and with joy and with satisfaction. See, some translations in 2 Corinthians 3.18 actually say, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That's why it says that because that's what that word literally means. You see, just as looking in a mirror reveals our physical features to show us, well, maybe in the morning what needs addressed. <laughs> it reflects, uh, you need to address this and this and this about your appearance before you go out, or, or don't, it's up to you. <laughs> but it reflects what's true about us. That's what a mirror does. When we behold the glory of the Lord in the face of Jesus Christ, you know what's gonna happen? The same thing. We're gonna see his greatness and we're also gonna understand our sin better. And this is what helps in our sanctification. As we turn and look to the glory of Christ, we understand how sinful we still are. And then we realize, wow, God, you saved me. You you saved me. Oh, let me run with endurance and look to you. And Lord, help me put sin to death. And that's what beholding him does. It reflects for us. So we understand not only our sin, but also this, that he's the one who will help us overcome it. And we're going to get to that in a little bit, that the power is going to come from him. It's a grace that's powerful. And you see, this will affect every dimension of our lives. Every dimension of our lives. Every tiny corner of our hearts will be impacted. And let's be honest, brothers and sisters, sometimes that's why we don't want to look in the mirror. Let's be honest. There are times that we don't want to look in the mirror because there's something going on that we don't want to address. And this is where our eyes get off. Our attention gets off. And we begin to rely upon ourselves and our feelings begin to dictate what's right and true. Because we know when we look in the mirror, we know we need this. But many times we won't because we know what will happen. Oh, please run to him in those moments. Run to his word See, we have, this is a great privilege. We have the privilege of beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ because, again, the veil has been taken away. Our once blind eyes now see. Our once hardened hearts now find joy in Christ himself. Yet again, as I mentioned, there's times that we find ourselves feeling dull or times we don't run to the word because there is a sin issue we don't want to deal with. Or sometimes it's this, sometimes... When people have been saved for a long period of time, they, there's just a dullness because they forget the excitement that came with salvation. Th- this is why, I don't know about you, but I, I love being around somebody who just got saved. <laughs> they are so excited. Their eyes are lit up. There, there's, there's almost, shall I say, even a glow about them that they... They cannot believe that they've been saved from their sin, that the burden of sin that's been weighing them down is gone. And when you're around them, you're just like, 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, that, that's me too, me too. And it, 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 it's, it's in, it infects us in a good way. But sometimes as the time goes by, we lose sight of that. Example, as many of you know, our family lived in Southern California for a while. People know two things about Southern California, LA in general. The traffic is horrible, and that is true. But the scenery is amazing. It really is. It's, it's breathtaking. And when we first got there, I'd be driving places. I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you guys see it? Dad, keep your eyes on the road. I mean, that's, that's we were just, it was awe-inspiring. And then years went by. And then someone would come visit us who hadn't been there before. And we'd be driving someplace. And they're like, wow, look at that. And I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen it a million times. And they're like, isn't that amazing? And I'd be like, Oh, yeah, I suppose. You see the point here? We can do that with Christ. We do. We take our eyes off. We forget the glory of who he is. We forget that we have really, really, really been saved by him. And you see, something else can happen. When we drift our focus like that, we take our eyes off of his glory Something else can happen. We can even then twist the love of God for us. Because the love of God for us is about what? It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus rescuing undeserving sinners for the glory of God's name. And for what? For a possession of his. That our salvation is about him. God's love is about Jesus for us. And then what can we do when we take our eyes off? We can twist that and think that God's love is about me. Now, don't misunderstand. There is an aspect that God's love is about us. For God so loved us so much that he sent his son, yes. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is this. We actually take Jesus out and make it about us. And we navigate through life expecting everyone else to also understand that. You should love me the way I want me to be loved because I'm really important. And we take our eyes off of who Jesus is and life becomes around us. And instead of growing in holiness, we learn to grow in selfishness. And everything around us that doesn't go the way that we want, we just squash it because we're the one who's important. And if I could borrow and also modify an illustration from John Piper here. When we do that, when we make the love of God only about us and not about the glory of his name and the glory of Jesus, when we do that, we become like a person standing before the beauty of the Grand Canyon and not feeling any awe or wonder unless we can make the existence and beauty of the canyon into a case for our own significance. play out like this. Now imagine this. I can't imagine this would happen, but this is what we do with the love of God sometimes. Standing before the Grand Canyon, someone goes, oh, wow, look at that. Isn't it amazing? And a person goes, I'm really amazing. Do you see the Grand Canyon? Aren't I amazing? And people are going to go, what is wrong with you? No one goes to the Grand Canyon to feel more significant about themselves. Nobody does. Why do people go to the Grand Canyon to go, wow, God, you did this? I I get to come see this because of how great you are? Wow. And we lose sight of ourselves, don't we? And we become taken over by something, humanly speaking, much greater than us that we can see. You see, our breath is taken away in those moments. But we can even be guilty of this, though. Even as a Christian, we can be guilty of this. We've got the family in the car. We're on our way to the Grand Canyon. We're so excited. Our hearts pound a little bit. Haven't been there before. We're talking about it. We're looking at pictures of it. Are we going to see this? Are we going to see this? Are we and it's just, it's filling the car with this excitement, this energy. We park. Everyone runs out to go. And we stand there and go, wow, look at this. Isn't this amazing? Take my picture. Wow, let's get a group. Hey, will you take our family's picture? We, we are just taken over by it. Why? Because we see something so magnificent with our eyes. But how much greater is Christ? The Grand Canyon, in comparison to Christ, is a speck, not even a speck of glory. 
It's not even a drop of glory compared to Christ. So we are excited about those things we can see, yet what? We struggle to pick up our Bibles. We sometimes trudge our way through spiritual things. We check the boxes of our spiritual lives. Why? Because we forget that we don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. And our faith is in one who is greater than anything this world has to offer. You see, there are an infinite number of reasons we should behold Christ. There are not enough sermons and time in the world before Jesus came back for us to unpack those. Let's just talk about two. What's one reason to behold Christ? The most obvious reason is this. He is worthy of being beheld. He is worthy. Let's remind ourselves who he is. Christ, the one who in his great love for us, he left the glories of heaven and came to earth as a man. And as John says, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John goes on to write in, later in chapter one, for, the, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He, Christ, has made him, the Father, known. He beheld his glory. And we can Two, <laughs> Christ, the one who lived the perfect life that we're completely incapable of living. Perfect obedience on our behalf. And then Christ, the creator of the universe, the one who never sinned became sin for us. The one who deserved only blessing received the full wrath of God in our place on the cross. The one who gives eternal life gave his very life for us. And then he rose victoriously from the dead, defeating sin, defeating Satan and death. And now he says, come and live. I did this out of my love for you. This is the glory of who Jesus Christ is. Come and live. The majesty and wonder of the love of God for us. The Grand Canyon's got nothing on Jesus Christ. He is worthy of all our praise. In the book of Revelation, just a, three verses for you here. Revelation 4.11, what is proclaimed about Christ? Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Revelation 5.12, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5.9, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Brothers and sisters, this is our savior. This is who he is. He's worthy. Behold him. Look to him. Are you struggling in your sanctification? Look to Jesus. Behold him. Read about him. Pray to him. Remind yourselves of who he is. He is worthy. And the second reason for beholding the glory of, of Christ, the glory of God that we're going to talk about this morning is this. When we do that, sin becomes less appealing. Sin will become less appealing. As we behold the glory of God and our affections are turned more and more toward Christ and towards righteousness, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says we will be transformed. That is the effect of it. Our hearts then find their greatest satisfaction where they should, in Christ. And then the things of this world that we once ran to out of sinful pleasure, they lose the allure that they once had. 
you know, we find strength in the grace of God to say no to sin. And we have the ability now to say no to sin. Why? Because that power of sin, broken. It doesn't have dominion over us anymore. We can say no to sin. And we behold his glory. What are we going to do? We're going to see and understand sin better in our life. And we're going to know we need to say no to that next time. I'm going to say no to that. Why? Because I want to behold Jesus and he's greater than any sin. And his grace is greater than our sin. And then our full contentment, our full joy, and our peace are found in him. So beholding is becoming. We will become what we behold. As we set the, our gaze of our hearts on Christ, we become more like him. Because we know sanctification, it is a supernatural work that God does within our being. Yet it's also something we participate in. So if we participate in this, God calls us to participate in it, yet it is a, it's a work that he's doing. Where does the power come from? How do we access this power? Because when we feel low and when we feel discouraged and when we are tempted by sin, we too often trust in ourselves and our own power. And thankfully, that's not where our power is supposed to come from. You see, we know we know very well that our justification, our, our, our salvation, we know that was the full power working of the grace of God in our lives. The grace of God has appeared bringing what? Salvation to all people. It brings salvation. But we sometimes forget that justification is grace-driven, but so is sanctification. It is a grace-driven principle in our lives. In other words, it isn't like this. God doesn't save us by his grace. Now say, now it's up to you. Hope that goes well for you. We're too weak for that. We still have these fleshly bodies. Our spirit will rage against our flesh. We can't overcome it unless what? Unless grace is there for us to go to. God doesn't leave us alone. He gives us the power of grace. So while we participate in our sanctification, our power in sanctification, it's God's grace. It's grace-driven. Again, we see that in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We see that something happens to us, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord. Look at how the phrasing is here. Are being transformed. That means this. It means something is being done to us that we don't do. What's our part? We all with unveiled face, beholding. Okay, we're, we're doing this. This is what I'm doing. I'm be, I behold. I, I behold his glory. And now something else happens to me that I can't do. God does it. It is the power of his grace. So see, sanctification, it's this. It's a sovereign work of the spirit of God by his grace. It's a sovereign work. But when I say it's a sovereign work, there's a danger we can have. The danger is this. Oh, God does it? Okay, let go and let God. I'm just gonna sit around and God's gonna sanctify me. Thanks, God, appreciate it. I'm a, no, no. Even though it's a sovereign work you see here, we participate in it. You see, it says at the end of verse 18, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. What? What is the this? For this comes. What is the this? Being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. God does that. For that, for this is from the Lord. You see, we see the same idea, the same principles in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we read this. Do not be conformed to this world. There's a command, don't do this. Now watch. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, that what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed. By the way, the word there for conformed in, in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed. Paul's talking about your outer things that you do, the outer part of you. You shouldn't look like the world is in a sense what he's saying. Don't be conformed to the pattern of the world. Don't, don't have your life look like the world's, but what? 
You, now, here's the thing. Something's being done to us. But what? But be transformed. Is that interesting? Don't do that, but allow this to happen to you. Uh, how do we do that, Paul? Well, he tells us, by the renewal of your mind. By the renewal, how do we renew our minds? Right here. <laughs> this is how we renew our minds. We read our Bibles. One of the simplest forms of sanctification. Don't use this, by the way, with somebody who's really struggling. Use this when you're laughing and having a good time together. Here, here's the most basic principle of sanctification I can tell people. <clears throat> You have a Bible? Okay, good. All right, here's what I want you to do when you go home. I want you to go home. I want you to read your Bible and do what it says. Got it? All right, thanks. That was a good meeting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go now. The point is this. Renew your mind. When we renew our mind, now again, please, no, it's not that simple. Don't actually use that with somebody who's struggling. But the principle is there. We renew our minds. When we renew our minds, what happens? We are going to be transformed. And guess what? Conformed is an outward thing. Transformed, guess what it is? It's inward. Paul doesn't say, don't have your life look like the world. Do have your life look like this instead. He says this, don't have your life look for the world. Now inwardly have something happen to you. So guess what? Later he'll say in Romans, then outwardly we'll see those things that inwardly have already happened. It's a sovereign work of the spirit of God by his grace. You see, we're commanded both in Romans 12, 2 and 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Here's what's interesting. We're commanded to have something done to us. Hey, you go do this, have this be done to you. Yet in both, we see clearly what our participation is. How can I be transformed from one degree of glory to another, God? How can I do that? Behold my glory. Okay. You behold my glory, I transform you. Hey, how can I not be conformed to the pattern of the world, Lord? Here's what you do. You renew your mind. When you renew your mind, when you do this, I will do that. There's a connection here. There's a connection here. It is a sovereign work of God that he invites us to participate in. And we also see this. We see that this grace, it's not only a sovereign work, but his powerful grace, it is sufficient. It is sufficient his grace is all that we need to grow in sanctification. His powerful grace is sufficient. If you would turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. This is a very important passage for us to understand where our power comes from. We already see that's a sovereign work of God. We see that. We see that we participate in this, yet God is going to sanctify us. He who began a good work in us, he will see it to completion at the day of, till the day of Christ. He will. He'll see it through to completion. He's sovereign. He's going to do it. And 2 Peter chapter 1, begin verse 2. 2 Peter 1, 2. My, uh, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Verse four, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You see, God's grace here, it says, it's multiplied to us in our knowledge of him. That's what it says. And then through his divine power, he has given us everything that we need for this life and godliness. In other words, Peter's saying this, God, dear Christian, God has given you everything you need to grow in holiness. You, as a believer, have everything that you need. First of all, he saved you. He did that for you. It's the first thing you need to grow in holiness. You need your heart, hardened heart taken out, and a heart of flesh given. You need a renewed mind. You, you need a new nature. He did that for you. And then he gave you his spirit. He gave you his spirit. And he gave you his word. So you have salvation, you have his spirit, and you have his word 
And here in our assembly, we have each other. That's another gift of the power of his grace. We have each other. And it says there, he's given us his promises. He's given us his promises to cling to so that we grow in godliness. Promises like this, that he'll work all things together for good to those who love him. Promises like this, that he'll never allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. Why? Because he's faithful to provide a way out of it. Promises like this, that when we lack wisdom, if you ask him, he'll give it to you. And promises like this, he'll never leave or forsake you. He'll be with you always. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, the God of peace will sanctify us completely. He will do this work. You know why? Because that's why he saved us in the first place, to make us a holy people, a holy nation for his glory so that we would represent his glory to the world and then he has a church that he has saved for himself. He is going to do this work. God's given us everything we need to battle against sin and to say no to it. His grace is sufficient. And we need to look no further than 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. When Paul, who asked for the thorn to be taken out of his flesh, he prayed three times for it to be taken away. It was tormenting him. He says it was a messenger of Satan tormenting him. He prayed, and, and what did Jesus Christ say to him? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Are you growing weary in your sanctification? His powerful grace is perfected in our weakness. That's where his grace is perfected. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, or excuse me, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, he says that his, he'll boast in his weaknesses because in his weaknesses, it says, that the power of Christ will then rest on him. That when he stops trudging and trying and doing it under his own power so much and he's having this great trial that it isn't let go and let God, it's not. It's I am understanding I am weak and now God's power rests on me and now I can endure and I now act. God is working in me his grace and now I work moving forward. I'm not sitting back passive. I'm actively living out this Christian life. And Paul, in the midst of great torment, was told that the grace he needed in that moment, it's sufficient. It's all he needed. You see, one of the greatest sins we can commit as a Christian is self-sufficiency. I got this. I'm good. My strength, my power, I'm all right. You see, we need sufficient grace. Jerry Bridges says this in his book, Transforming Grace. He says, the more we see our frailty, weakness, and dependence, the more we appreciate God's grace in its dimension of his divine assistance. Just as grace shines more brilliantly against the dark background of our sin, so it also shines more brilliantly against the background of our human weakness. End quote. You see, in this grace that works powerfully through us, his powerful grace also trains us. It saves us and it trains us. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, when? In the present age, right now. His grace is sufficient for you, and it is powerful. It works in you right now. Not for tomorrow, not for, I'll, I'll get around to that right now, in this present age. Why? It says later there, that Paul writing to Titus later, says that Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This grace, powerful grace, it's sufficient and it trains us. As we behold the glory of the Lord and have our perspective right, 
then we understand the power of God's grace in our weakness. And then we recognize the sin for what it is. It's of this world. It's a lie. It promises one thing, but it only brings pain and destruction. Now, it might give a fleeting moment of pleasure, but ultimately, it is sinful pleasures that don't satisfy, and they're opposed to the, to, to the will of God. So his powerful grace is sufficient, it trains us, and it also is at work within us. It's at work within us. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. We're going to, just for a minute here, look at it. And then it's going to help us next week as we look next week at our participation in sanctification. But I'm going to look at it this morning, and here's why. I want us to understand, this is why we've done it this way in terms of the sermon series. We started with what? What is sanctification? What does it look like? How are we going to struggle? Let, let's get a theological grounding. Now, let's make sure our perspective is right. Let's remember where power comes from. And now, next, then next week, here's what we now do. God works in us, so here's how we work. Understanding what? It's his power. It's his powerful grace working in us. But Philippians 2, verse 12 says this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13. For in it, for, excuse me, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For it is God who is at work in you. His powerful grace is at work within us. See, these two verses capture the truth that while we participate in our sanctification, that our participation, our working, it's motivated and it's fueled by the grace of God. We are to work out things in our life. Why? Because God is at work within. We work out because he's at work within. We're called to obey the commands of Scripture, but it is God empowering us, working in us to be able to do so from within. And here's, here's the great paradox. The great paradox is this. God calls us to obey. We have no ability to obey on our own. God gives us the ability to obey, and then God doesn't obey for us. We obey in that moment. But he empowers us to obey. That's why the beauty of Christ is so amazing because Jesus Christ always obeyed and he did obey in his life for us. So when he went to the cross, he was the perfect high priest for us because he had no sin to pay for himself. He paid for our sin. He obeyed constantly and now we're called to obey and we only can do it, how? By his powerful grace at work in us. And then we walk in obedience. See, not only are we not alone in fighting against sin and dealing with trials in our sanctification, but it's God himself working in us for his good pleasure. God is fulfilling his good purposes in us by his strength and by his power. That's how God does it. See, this should be a very comforting thought in our battle against sin. See, we can say no to sin. We can obey the commands of Scripture. And Kevin DeYoung wrote a book called The Hole in Our Holiness. And in, in one section of this book, he reminds us that we should not ignore and we should not diminish this powerful grace of the Holy Spirit in us. And he says this, The same Spirit who was present at creation and caused you to be born again is at work to empower your inner person, that is your will or heart, so that you might resist sins you couldn't resist before, and do the good things which would otherwise be impossible. Defeatist Christians who do not fight against sins because they figure they were born this way, or well, I'll never change, or I don't have enough faith, they are not being humble. They dishonor the Holy Spirit who strengthens us with supernatural power. End quote. This powerful grace is at work in us. That's our power. Our power comes from him and his grace, not from us. So you see, our perspective in sanctification should be what? Beholding his glory. He's worthy of that. 
He's the most glorious subject we could ever focus our gaze and attention and affections on. And the more that we focus on him, then we also then will remember that our power source is his very grace at work within us through the Holy Spirit, through him who indwells us. And so now that we've spent these two weeks looking at what sanctification is, and how we now need to think rightly about it, our perspective and our power source. Next week, we'll look at specific ways or specific means that God provides for us to, guess what? Work out our salvation with fear and trembling. To work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We work. God gives us means by which to work. And when we work, God then works also in us through those things. He works in us to do those things, and he works in us as we do those things. Because Ephesians 3.16 says this, and we'll close with this. When Paul prays for the church in Ephesus, and he says he bends his knees before the Holy Father, he says this, he prays that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Let's pray together. Lord, that is our prayer this morning as we think about our growing in holiness. Lord, would you, according to the riches of your glory, Lord, would you grant to us to be strengthened with power through your spirit in us? Lord, you are the most glorious awe-inspiring object that we ever could set our affections upon, the person of who you are. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us remember to set our gaze, to behold you, to in our hearts have our breath taken away again of the glory of salvation, that you would save such rebels like us sinful wretches undeserving of grace and you bestowed it upon us and now lord you continue to pour out upon us your riches of glory your beautiful sufficient powerful grace you continue to give it to us and lord in our battle against sin lord help us remember lord that your grace your grace it is greater than all of our sin. It is greater than all of our sin. Lord, strengthen us to remember that. Behold you, draw from you the power that we need as you work in us. Lord, work in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.